And that, that's, really that's really entertaining uh, when you start to look at what's the matter behind this and you start to realize that when you are the beginning of a wave, you tend to underestimate trends because you're not too sure how they unfold. And when you are at the end of a wave or when you're in a full-fledged growth, you now you start to overestimate uh, the future. And then you have, uh, so, and then you, again, you always think linearly. So we're going to talk a bit about this. This is uh, actually a, a part of it is a paper that I have, a, which is a co-author co with a French colleague of mine, which is uh, David Guerlo from uh, Paris, uh, Paris University. So I have to uh, at least pay some credit here a little bit. So allow me to move on. Uh, again, there was a recent article about the Economist, in the Economist, which labeled the container the humble hero, and uh, it's it's a very appropriate term. Because there's not that many things that has changed so much, and while so few people are acknowledging it, in a sense. And that box, even if it's simple, it's actually reflecting very complex issues, because it's, it's many things at the same time. It, it's, it's, of course, you can transport things about this, but also, people also manage supply chains within container batches. Yeah, yeah, again, you have different elements, different views about how how do you handle these boxes? And this is simply a, a simple representation of uh, th those benefits. The, those, uh, we call that, uh, I call it the, the multiplier of globalization. If it was just, if we were still with break bulk, standard break bulk, the global economy would have been impossible. China would have been impossible. The, all the export of the economy. This would not make, uh, would have been completely infeasible. So you have to acknowledge that after 50 years of containerization, that this humble hero has made a tremendous contribution to, let's say, global trade and, uh, and, uh, and the process of globalization from different perspectives. And they're very well known in terms of, of course, the first obvious one is uh, um, transportation costs. This is very well known. There, there are plenty of evidence that ma mentions that conta containerization drop con uh, transport costs by a factor of 20 times in, in some cases. That's easy to, uh, to, uh, to assess. What I, like, what I find something very, very interesting, and people fail to realize this, is containerization has changed the rule of the game in terms of what load unit you need to be involved with to participate in global trade. That is, prior to containerization, you had to have quite a, be quite a big player to be able to export or to import. But now with container, what you need is the minimum load unit is essentially one box. If you can fill up one box, you can trade. So what do we start to observe, and I have a few research projects about this, and let's say in, in, the, in the Midwest, for instance, in Western Canada, you start to have small slaughterhouses able to export meat to China or to Japan because they can, they're able to fill one or two or three boxes per week, and that's all they need. It's only they were beforehand not a player at all and suddenly became a global player. They found themselves a niche. So there are a lot of the interesting ramifications behind this process. Of course, we talk about inventory cost, which is very interesting. That is, the container becomes a management unit. It's a storage. It's a warehouse. And I saw a lot of very interesting ways that this box is used for inventory purposes. Sometimes at the terminal itself, they use the terminal as a warehouse. And uh, I've seen that taking place in Europe, for instance, when you have an inland terminal and the container's at the inland terminal. And they say, why do you keep it there for a week, two weeks, when you bring it to your warehouse? <laughs> why should I do that? It's there for free or for a very low cost. I'm going to call the box when it is, when I need it. And again, I'm going to bring it up because it's very nearby. So you see things popping out in ways that you do not see coming. I have a question for you. Some of you know this very well. What is America's leading containerized export? Hmm? Uh, okay, you're right. <laughs> we sell nice, fresh American hair that goes all the way to, okay. But let's say if there's something in the container <laughs> except, except fresh air, what is the leading export? Food? No. <laughs> you see it pretty much every day. We export trash, waste product. And when you observe what is the Pacific trade, it's the biggest recycling system in human history. I call it the garbage in, garbage out system. <laughs> what I mean by this, the major importers are obviously the usual suspects. Walmart, Home Depot, so garbage in. Those products, those, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> try, try to entertain the audience here a little bit in the evening. Uh, it's my jokes are funnier when you have a couple of glasses of wine. So. 
Enjoy. Uh, so you have this. So it, the product has been consumed and then discarded. Then this garbage has been collected and then brought across the Pacific <laughs> back to Asia, especially China, to be reintroduced in the supply chain, to be recycled and brought back. So it's a very interesting loop. Again, I'm not sure how efficient it is, but actually, that's, I find, I find, that's something I found very interesting. Again, without a container, such patterns, such systems will not exist. So is that sustainable? Because it's a recycling system. You know, the China or, uh, has been very good at taking all the waste product of North America, waste metals and so on and so forth, bring them back and reusing it for, for something else. Uh, so let's, let's move on. So this is what I meant in a sense that the container is a transport unit. It is a production unit, depending upon who you are. From people that say they're not concerned about a container as a, as a movement, they're concerned they concern about containerization or container as something that you manage production with. You organize your production to fit container batches exactly. I saw, I saw the, for instance, car manufacturers that have redesigned their distribution as soon as they went globally to make their goods, to make their batches, their, I would say their parts, fit well into a container. So that, that again, you have to me me measure that. Um, and then, of course, the container is a distribution unit, and it's, of course, a warehousing unit. You use it for storage purposes. And for instance, uh, when you do, do some advice, and when, because the big name these days uh, in terms of containerization or the big trend is what we call inland ports. They're popping out all over the place uh, around the world. And when you advise them, say, what, what type of strategy? You say, give them a lot of free time, store, the murage time, because it enables them to use this facility as some kind of a store for storage purposes. And it help them their plan their supply chain accordingly. And you cannot do that at congested area, but if you have, if you have space, do it or so. So yeah, con consider container from such a perspective. Here, I won't go to do this into details. You try to combine, or let's say compile a list of what are the advantages, and they're pretty well known. It's standardized, which is very useful, of course. It's flexible. I've seen everything imaginable being put into a container. Amazing. Again, waste paper, I saw coal. Again, if you study transport economics, that does not compute. But when you have a in, in balance trade, you have a uh, you have a lower rate for outbound flows. When you have very specific uh, trade emerging, you see these type of issues um, uh, taking place of, of stuff you would not expect being being moved into containers. So grain also is a, is a very active trade. Uh, obviously, we talk about cost, speed, warehousing, security. All these issues have, have contribute pretty well to the diffusion of the container as a as a transport and supply chain management unit. Again. This is stuff coming straight from my website. However, there are plenty also of challenges related to that damn box. That is, the whole process of containerization has created a new form of space, which is you need a lot of storage, a lot of flat areas in order to, to handle these volumes. So it has forced some kind of sub-arborization process uh, across the world. This is pretty well known, has been studied for the last 20, 30 years or so, that port facilities were forced, sometimes, depends on the setting, to move to new sites because the, the ancient sites were no longer suitable for, for container use. Plenty of examples, I can give you an example of New York, that the port has completely shifted. The port of New York is in New Jersey, just again because of, the, of those requirements. Uh, it's of course, it's capital intensive. That's a very big issue in developing economies. Uh, and this brings the, po the, pro the, uh, the, uh, the growing importance of what we call global terminal operators. That is, since it's a capital and knowledge and skill specific uh, industry, you, you, there are a lot of firms that have emerged which are specializing into the handling of those or the management of those terminal facilities and they're bidding for concessions all over the world to establish themselves. To, uh, because they come with deep pockets often, and they have a very interesting, uh, can I say, like global perspective about the management of their assets. Some of them are backed by pension funds. Some of, back, some of them are backed by sovereign wealth funds. And we did recently a study about all the global terminal operators. We built a database about them, and we were shocked. Uh, they, much they were completely, there were four players completely globalized, controlling something like 35 to 40 percent of the global trade by about four co terminal operators. Were, were assets, were pos they, were, they were positioned, and they, have a, they had a global strategy. And they were, when they were willing to invest, they invest. And they, if they want, they're going to build a port out of nowhere, if it fits their strategy. Again, for example, recently, 
I think uh, the port uh, in uh, Costa Rica, the port of Limon Wine, will be built by APM, which is a, 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 a let's say a parent company of MERS, which is the world's largest shipping company. And why they build that port? Simply because they want to ship bananas to the United States. Simple. It cold chain logistics. Build a port mainly for that form of logistic. And again, when it fits the strategy, they're going to provide the capital. So many developing countries uh, feel, uh, feel a little bit uneasy because most of the time ports used to be deeply regional, deeply national issues under the control of, of local or national interests. But these, these players coming in the game are, are shifting the dynamics, I would say, quite substantially. Uh, this is the, one of the biggest problems about containerization. It's an unsolvable problem. It's the imbalance in flows. Uh, at the global level, about 20% of all the move container move are empty. And what can you do? Nothing, because it's linked with trade imbalances. You have trade imbalances, you have container flow imbalances. You can, you can try whatever you want in terms of cargo rotation strategy, uh, some form of uh, attempt to, to rebalance the trade. But as long as you have, uh, let's say, an American economy, which is deeply retail oriented, import oriented, which have limited exports, at least that can be containerized, you know, you're going to be facing this problem. Anyway.